you will need this photo. You can get it on my website. Um, you can get it other places uh, if you're taking the class. So, the cube that we are looking at here is a simple cube and it's canted at a 45 degree angle. Now, I'm going to teach you some basic things about how to draw, but we're not going to go over something called linear perspective yet. So we're going to guesstimate the top of the box and the sides of the box and the shape of the shadow without using a system that you'll learn later that's called linear perspective. <clears throat> this one is called, just for the sake of argument, isometric perspective. The things to pay the most attention to about drawing the cube are that the sides of the edges, the vertical uprights, need to be parallel with the sides of the picture plane. Now when I photographed this, I actually fixed it so that that was the case, so that it was more the ideal, and I did the same thing with the cylinder that we'll be drawing later. The other thing is, is that, <clears throat> at least for this drawing, you're just going to be basically making a diamond for the top, and that these angles need to match up on the top and the bottom. These angles need to be the same angle. So the horizontal lines need to be completely um, horizontal for the back edge of the table. The vertical line need, needs to be completely vertical. Let's begin first by thinking about where we're going to place this on the paper. Because one of the things that um, I want you to start also thinking about is making the drawing as complete as possible. So if you imagine that this piece of paper is actually what you're drawing here needs to fit on the shape of the paper that we're looking at right now, a way to do that might be even just to put pieces of paper over it to see what the arrangement would be. And I guess the, the edge of this border would be fine. So that's how I'm going to draw it. It's going to be uh, slightly off-center to the half of the page. Uh, the shadow is going to fit in there. So if you were to make an imaginary vertical line, this is the halfway mark, so that kind of gives me an idea. And that means that this diamond, this, this apex of this diamond, is about a third of the way through the halfway mark. And I'll show you what I'm talking about with that. <clears throat> if, the if the photograph that you're working from is a cognate to what we were just talking about, the if this is the halfway mark, this is about where the edge of that shape met. And I just want to make sure it fits on the page, so all I have to do is put another um, dot over here, and that gives me an idea. Now, um, the back of the table, if I want this thing to fill up most of the page, and I want the apex of the diamond to be in basically about the center, and this is the bottom of that diamond, <coughs> I need these angles to match up. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is, I know that this is basically a cube, so all the sides need to be about equal. So I just need to eyeball roughly a distance there and make sure that the angle of the thing that I'm making matches there. All right. So now I've got these points, which correspond to the major points on this drawing. One, two, three, four. Two, three. Four, we can, that's the bottom. So I already know that all of the lines need to be horizontal, uh, vertical and parallel with the edges. So it's pretty easy to just draw lines that you know are the same distance from the edge straight up and down. Okay. The next thing is you draw the lines that connect. And part of learning how to do this is eyeballing things and making sure it's correct. If anything, these edges need to get smaller rather than widen, okay? Um, you can use a ruler to measure this, but you know what? I'd like for you to learn how to do it just by eyeball. So now I've got these points that are on the paper, and I'm going to... This angle needs to be parallel with this, okay? So that's pretty easy, and I have the diamond. Now, even so, look, my proportions are slightly off. That's okay, <coughs> because it's an ideal form. <clears throat> now, the next thing is, I need to make the back of the tabletop, this horizon line. Now, considering how much space I've given myself, if you look at this edge here, 
it's a little bit less than halfway. So I could probably just eyeball, that's about halfway, so a little bit less than halfway. And a good way to do this, to abstract it for yourself, is to turn the paper on the side, and what you're doing is you're drawing a vertical line that runs all the way through the picture, more or less, and is parallel with the top and the bottom. Okay? Now, the next thing is the cast shadow. What you're seeing on a cast shadow is this triangle is actually this triangle here. And this straight line is actually coming off from the back point there, and it makes it look almost like a house. Notice that these lines are tilted up slightly, okay? Um, that's okay too. We'll just we'll we'll work with that. We'll throw it off a couple of degrees just so that the light kind of works. So if this is the the line horizontally, we know it's just off slightly and it goes up to something like that. And so I could give myself a line, and I'll just look at the space in the back here. Look at this shape here. It actually mimics the shape of this diamond here. Okay. So that back shape. If I was to just mimic the shape of the diamond and have it intersect with the background, the tabletop, and then just continue these angles, now I kind of have a nice shadow. This isn't a scientific or hard fast method, but it's just a way to, to get you to map things and get things to be established flat on the page and straight on the page. And that's really important, um, is getting to know how to map things out. And I've talked about that uh, significantly in my drawing class, and I'm going to keep talking about it because what I want you to really consider is make sure that you have accurate shapes and that your verticals and horizontals are parallel with the edges. Because you'll see, if you look at other people's still life drawings, look them up on the internet, you'll see that a lot of times that stuff is off. Now the next thing is I have this um, mapped in. And I'm using those lithographic crayons that I discussed with you in the last video on the sphere. Uh, basically, they're pencils and all kinds of stuff that you can use. And what I'm going to do is, it's almost what I consider to be sort of glazing. Uh, I develop these things almost like you're developing photographs. They don't go any place too fast, uh, any of the values. So let's consider the background value of absolute 10 if we're going to sort of talk about it as digitized. So one of the things that you could do is you could take this big flat piece of, of um, lithographic crayon and if you're using uh, graphite you can do that or charcoal. But all the materials are the same. The only difference is I can't erase today uh, because I wanted to use something that was dark enough that the camera could really pick it up and you could see the value structure. So that's nowhere near a 10, it's just a darker value. Now what I'm going to do is, the light is coming from the upper right hand corner and it's raking across here and I want to sh go over this photo and just point out some things that I think are pretty important to notice. This plane is almost absolute white, okay? Um, there's actually just a very fine line of white that's at the very top that's like a highlight. I actually kind of like that. I'm going to leave that in there, but you could make it a single plane of, of white. This is the second lightest plane. This is the third lightest plane. This is the fourth lightest plane. Um, so you have to match up the values, but if the tabletop were lighter, it'd be lighter, that kind of thing. So what I'm doing is I'm thinking about it as a jigsaw puzzle, and I'm hoping that the values will all come together um, to erase the appearance of outlines, that where the planes or the shaded areas meet will define edge rather than having to define the edge through um, line, through drawing a hard black line. And that's what it's going to make it kind of look uh, photorealistic. So you can see that just by very lightly going over each of the areas, and I start from dark um, to light actually, but the, what I do is I don't go to number 10 dark. This is not even probably a 3 or 4 dark yet. It's as, this, is, this is probably the same value as the top of the uh, cube. But what I'm doing is I'm developing the values a little bit at a time to allow myself to kind of make the values relative to one another and make sense overall. And this is particularly helpful 
if you plan on becoming a painter. Because if you work the whole picture at the same time and not just one section, what's going to happen is you're going to feel a little bit more unified in what you do. So um, at one point I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to speed up the video to about 500 times the speed so that you can see how I'm going over everything. But I wanted you to see how I establish everything in real time uh, using basically the biggest piece of um, drawing material I have. And I also wanted to make sure that I discussed with you again the idea of finishing the drawing all the way to the edges and filling up the space as best you can so that it's kind of an interesting composition. And so I'll just keep drawing on that. Now a word about the edges of shadows. Basically what I'm doing is I'm lengthening that cast shadow slightly so that I can feather the edges as it moves away from the object. See how it's getting a little bit lighter towards the edge? Um, and the function of that is that as things are closer to the object, less light is bouncing around and leaking around that thing. And as you move away from it, um, more is happening. <clears throat> Some people also talk about shading the edges closest to the light the darkest almost as if these were core shadows and I guess in a way they are it's where your eye would be able to be the less sensitive to see I think it's almost better <clears throat> in the case of a beginning uh, artist to think about making the planes pretty consistent and not worrying so much about varying the tone across the plane but that's if you want to look at the photograph and see what really happens it's a combination of me photoshop editing and actually some things like for instance there it's a little darker along there um, in the photograph so I would suggest that rather than getting wrapped up in trying to find all of the various tonal variations that what you do is is that you just try to make the planes consistent and learn how to control your pencil as best you can. Now I'll speed it back up again.
<clears throat> All right, so that <clears throat> is the cube um, in terms of shading. Now, <clears throat> some things I want to point out to you before we move on to cross-hatching. I hope that you notice that I built up the edges slowly over time <clears throat> and that I kept going back over and working the entire drawing and um, it took me quite a while to, to, to develop um, this level of, of darkness in the, the drawing and that it wasn't something that I went to immediately and that also something should happen to you when you're working on a drawing that almost makes you not want to um, put it down like that you could keep perfecting it and I think that's something that artists do that <clears throat> something to think about is drawing is like a video game and every time you make a new drawing you go to another level or you place you, you don't do very well. And I always think of drawing as um, as almost like a video game that I keep trying to win at, uh, especially with accuracy and things like that. So this next thing is I want to show you how to do a crosshatch drawing. And I'm going to use a big Sharpie marker. And uh, I'm going to just do, well, let's see how many I, I feel like doing. Now, the same thing that was about this cube before is I'm just going to use the, pretty much the same composition. And since I drew it once before, I kind of even really understand where everything is. So I'm going to just give myself uh, a tabletop and I'm going to put that, uh, sketch out a diamond. Uh, drop off some verticals. Now, you should practice these as many times as you can possibly stand to uh, and do them over and over again. And the reason why I keep saying that is that um, it looks like it's almost easy for me to do this, although it's not. Um, and it's a skill set that you actually need to develop in order to make larger, more complex drawings is to map out the basic shapes and try to make sure that your verticals are uh, echoing the sides of the picture plane, that your horizontal is, is straight across, and that you try to match angles as best you can. Um, in this instance, I've got a little angle that's off slightly. It needs to get smaller towards the back edge of any object. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to these marks are just uh, sort of plotting mar marks or, or map marks. The next thing is I'm going to start with hatch marks. And a hatch mark is just basically um, like a chicken scratch, a, like a, a hatch in the sand or something like that. And I, what I do is I think of it almost like laying screens across screens, where um, each time I make a mark, uh, it overlaps with another mark, and I can keep building up the frequency of a lot of those marks to try to uh, say something about the space. So, for instance, in the background here, uh, I'm going to build up the background quite a bit and try to also um, enter something that you might call gesture into the drawing a little bit, which is the joy of just making scribbly marks, I guess. Uh, for me, that's what it is. Um, and so I'm building up with different sorts of patterns the edges of the objects, right? And they don't have to be hard, um, firm, mechanical lines. They actually still show that a person, not a machine, made them, right? 
And so what's going to happen is those sort of sketchy edges that I designed initially will dissolve and I can resolve uh, edges as I go deeper into value. That's why I start always as light as I possibly can. And what I do is I draw the dark values in a very, very light way to set off the edges. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed the video up and uh, let you watch it at uh, full speed uh, at 500 times the, the normal speed. Okay.